Hi there, my name is Dave Bonaguidi. I'm a printmaker artist based in Hackney in London. And um, the theme of today's presentation is uh, onwards and upwards. In my experience, I don't think life is um, quite that straightforward. Um, and my take on that is a little bit more upwards, downwards, sideways, then onwards, and hopefully upwards, fingers and toes crossed. I've got this theory that uh, life is like a tube of Pringles. Um, at the beginning, you're sitting there grabbing five or six of them at a time, smashing them all down your mouth. You just keep going. And then there's a moment when your little fat hand doesn't fit in the tube and you have to kind of stick your fingers down and reach for them a little bit more. That's when you really start to appreciate them. When you get to my age, I'm 57, I'm at the metaphorical probably lower end of the, uh, of the tube and uh, it's full of broken pieces and all the shrapnel that gathers at the bottom. And you have to tip it and dab your finger and really, really enjoy and savour those moments. Let them melt on your tongue. Now, wouldn't it be nice if uh, I could be enjoying those first 30 that I destroyed in moments as much as I'm enjoying the little bits of Pringle shrapnel at the end? And a lot of this was, I think, driven by a... Um, incident I had when I met the Grim Reaper in 1978 at the age of 14. I have absolutely no idea what happened. Uh, my sister found me in the family home, um, hanging from the banisters with my school tie. Uh, she went in and told my mum that I was dead. Um, my mum came out and said, don't be stupid, he's not dead. Saw me on the banisters uh, and said, oh, he looks dead. Um, they called the ambulance, the ambulance turned up and said, he's dead. Uh, my mum asked them if they could get me going again. They managed to get me going again. Uh, I went into spasm, which is something that happens when you've got when you have oxygen starvation to the brain. Uh, I went to the hospital. Uh, the doctors said, "Ooh, he's not going to survive the night." Um, they had a priest come in and give me the uh, last rites. Uh, I was effectively in a coma. Um, I was told again the following morning that he won't survive any longer. They got the priest in again to do the second version of the last rites. And um, I was told, or my parents were told, that if I did survive, which was very unlikely, I would be in a vegetative state forever. Um, look at me now. I think it's probably the, uh, it's a respawn of sorts, but I was very lucky. Uh, I don't know what happened. I've never really tried to work out what's happened. But one of the things that uh, does happen is that, you know, obviously when you have a near death or an actual death experience in your life is that you... Uh, it should change your perspective on how you think about things and how you go forward, take, take advantage of the, the amazing situation that you've got. Now, I didn't do any of that. Um, I'm incredibly lazy. When I was at school, I was terrible, awful, wasn't interested in anything. Um, couldn't be bothered to do stuff that I wasn't interested in. Um, but the one thing that I think I did inherit as a result of this near-death experience, if I gained a superpower as a result of it, it would be that I became incredibly lucky. Um, I fluked my way through school, uh, fluked my way into art school, uh, fluked my way through that, just by doing, probably just by doing just enough to get me through it. My dad, um, at the time, uh, had an Italian restaurant in Fulham and Chelsea. Uh, all the people that worked in advertising at the time used to use that place as their local canteen. And as a result, I just had access to all these incredible brains and these incredible friends of my dad and um, managed to fluke my way into quite a few agencies that would, you know my dad, can I come and work in your place for a couple of weeks? And, many, and lots and lots of them were very, very generous and offered me that opportunity. I ended up working in advertising for 35 years. Um, it was an incredible uh, period of time to have started work in the mid 80s where uh, there wasn't an awful lot of information around, there wasn't a lot of data, the internet obviously hadn't been invented, clients weren't aware of what worked and what didn't work, they took our words for, for it. Um, but as a result, as, as the sort of business changed over 35 years, um, my attitudes towards it changed. Um, I worked in very, very big agencies, big multinationals. I worked in small agencies. I worked in a lot of startups. And one of the things I loved more than anything was the drama and the, the craziness of a startup um, opportunity because you're, there's no padding. You're there, you open the door, and it's just unfiltered. And it's entirely up to you. You have a good day at the office, 
um, it's a success, you have a bad day at the office, it's an absolute disaster, and there is nothing that can compare to that. Um, and that, I think, probably triggered me to want to set up my own businesses, which I did a few of, um, to varying degrees of success. Um, there's an interesting thing that happens in your 20s, or when you start your career, I happened to start when I was kind of just about 20, um, as you progress through your career, your 20s, 30s, 40s and 50s, um, there's an interesting thing that happens is obviously in your 20s you're, you're concerned about interacting with lots of other people of lots of different ages because suddenly you're thrown into a business where you've got lots of bosses and you've got lots of clients you have to answer to and you, you get into a kind of rhythm of professionalism. There's also the social side of it because you're hanging around lots of other people that are like you and you're kind of getting excited and you're doing lots of fun things and you're learning, which is fascinating and intriguing and very stimulating if you're, if you're kind of into that kind of thing. When you get into your 30s, you change gear a little bit. Suddenly it's about whether it's a nesting thing, whether it's uh, kind of building, uh, you know, you start thinking about relationships, you start thinking about my career a little bit more. What am I going to do? What am I going to do for the next 10 years? What's my ambition? Um, you start having kids, uh, suddenly you have lots more responsibilities, your ambition challenges uh, you know, where you were in your 20s. And then when you're in your 40s, you should be at kind of ramming speed. You should be sitting there thinking, right, you know, I've got, I'm married, I've got my house, I've got my car, whatever it is, all of those things that you want in the material world. But also in your career, you'll start to think about, you know, do I want to run my own business? Do I want to run a department? Do I want more responsibility? Do I want to earn more money? Whatever it might be. And then you hit this sort of moment when you're absolutely at your peak in your 40s and suddenly when you hit 50, everything changes. It's like the lights coming on in a nightclub where you suddenly go, oh my God, look at the carpet, it's disgusting. Um, the thing I noticed was that um, businesses now are very, very young, full of very, very young, very inexperienced people and it becomes a high churn industry. Whereas in the past, certainly when I started work, having experience around was really valuable. Problem now is that experience is expensive. Um, the bosses of any big business, big multinationals, corporate businesses will be looking around going, who's effectively good for business? And they'll look at the 50 year old bloke or woman who's sitting in their office uh, eating M&S sandwiches, looking out the window, wondering what's the matter with their life and wondering why aren't they sitting with all the cool young kids who are sitting in the canteen area talking about Love Island. Um, and suddenly you become a, a, a bit of a moving target. You're expensive, you're maybe not as respected as you could be, and suddenly you go from being quite powerful and quite influential to being an extra that needs to be got rid of because with the money that we get rid of you, we can um, hire 35 young kids who have no experience at all. And you become very expendable. And I think that's a real shame. Um, I had a similar moment when um, I was running my own business, well, I had my own business for a long time, and I hit 50, and I suddenly felt like everybody was looking at me like, we need to get rid of him. Not a very nice feeling. Um, if you're sitting there watching this online, uh, and you're in a nice big city, we are collectively probably the fortunate 1% of planet Earth. Um, we can choose where we live, we can choose what we eat, we can choose what we wear, who we hang around with, what we do. Um, very fortunate in comparison to the other 99% of people on earth who are not as fortunate as us. And I sat there thinking, wow, you know, I'm so fortunate. I live in London, in a first world city, in a first world nation. I do this job that I work in advertising. You know, I'm in control of everything in my life. And I actually looked at all the different aspects of my life, my relationship, my job. I thought, I bloody hate all of it. I didn't like, my marriage was a, a total mess. Um, my job, even though it was my business, I was working with people I didn't like, doing things I didn't want to do. Um, and I suddenly thought, Christ, you know, I'm 50. I've got fewer years ahead of me than I've got behind me. Is this it? Is this it? Is this what I now have to transition into? I just have to carry on going until I drop dead or get fired and then become totally useless. And I just thought, I'm not gonna stand for that. Um, I really wanna take control of what I'm doing and uh, do stuff that makes me feel good because I was working my ass off in a place that I didn't like with a load of other people that I didn't like to support 
you know, a, a family and a marriage that was not working. And I just thought it was just toxic all the way through. Um, I left the business I was working in. I was put on gardening leave for a year, which is basically where your employee, the, the people that you worked with, uh, try to stop you from stealing clients or stealing staff. Um, and uh, they just try to kill your spirit. They pay you to effectively stay at home, but just to take all the momentum out of your new idea. And so I knew that I wasn't going to be able to work for a year. Um, and I just thought, I'm going to try and do something new and learn something new. Um, I had these dreams that I would um, learn how to screen print, I would learn how to sculpt and learn how to save a life. And I thought there'd be quite interesting things to do over a year. The problem I had was that I did the... I did a screen printing course just around the corner from where I live in Dalston and um, literally the day after I got back I said right that's what I want to do from now on I want to change my life I want to become an artist and um, it was it was literally a life-changing moment when I just thought I cannot continue doing the corporate model the model that I'd been used to for 35 for 30 30 years at the time I have to do something else that's going to make me feel good and, and in a way, selfishly, uh, be something that I really wanted to do rather than stuff I had to do for everybody else. Um, if, you, if you take my slightly twisted um, metaphor about life and Pringles um, a little step further, you can sort of say that if you're lucky in this world, you get 80 years. Um, I'm 57 now, so that technically means I've got 23 summers left. Now, when you say 23 summers, it really brings it into perspective for me because summers in this country are really, really short. Uh, I would also say that the last 10 are probably going to be a bit more of a challenge. You know, my legs aren't going to work. My brain probably isn't going to work that well. Uh, I will probably find myself or you'll probably find me in somewhere in Hackney running around in my underpants shouting at cars and barking at dogs. So I've got 13 years left, and that's not great. So when I made that decision that I was gonna be an artist uh, in 2015, it took me until uh, 2020 when I turned full-time, got stopped working in the corporate side and became much more studio-based. And um, so it's taken me like just over five years to transition from one career to another and it is probably the most liberating feeling I've ever had. I mean, it's literally like stepping out of uh, jail after doing a 35 year sentence. Um, and, the, and the really good thing, the really interesting thing as a creative, the thing that I loved uh, is coming up with ideas. Um, the thing I really hated about advertising was that the, the, the ratio of coming up with ideas to actually making ideas was literally 100 to 1. So with every, every project that I would do, you were required effectively to come up with 100 ideas and ceremonially destroy 99 of them. And that was just part of it. That was what was expected, um, which I just think is a horrendous waste of, uh, of time, waste of work, waste of creativity. Now in my studio... Uh, I can come up with 100 ideas and I get to make 150 of them because every time I come up with an idea, it will trigger something else, something else will come along, something else will come along. And that ratio from moving from 100 to 1 to 1 to 100 is really, really fascinating and very invigorating for any creative mind. Um, my only agenda now is to, uh, selfishly, to be happy. You know, I'm no longer married. I'm no longer working, doing a job that I can't stand doing with people I hate. Um, and it's a very easy routine to get into. It's a very easy routine to fall into. You guys, a lot of you guys are very, very young and you'll find yourselves getting into careers. Something will happen. You'll find yourself in a job and then all of a sudden, 15 years later, you'll find yourself having got quite a lot further on in that job and you just think, what the hell am I doing? I can't stand doing what I do. I don't like the people I'm working with. It's a very easy thing to do. And to keep check of that and to constantly ask yourself, are you happy? And that's one of the things that we don't do enough. We often say, am I rich enough? Am I doing the things that I want to do? You never think about whether it makes you happy. Um, and then also, more importantly, I think it's about freedom. It's about uh, we are very, very fortunate that we live and we do what we do and we are in, in wherever we are because um, compared to a lot of people around the world, we are unbelievably blessed. And the, the chance to be free to 
do what you want to do and to uh, live the life, live your best life, I think is can be very challenging for a lot of people. But you know, if you if you can try it, bloody hell, there's a dog barking upstairs. He does my head in. Anyway, he stopped. Uh, where was I? Um, it's just to be free and you know live your best life and make the most of the opportunity that you've got you know I was very fortunate at 14 um, died uh, and then um, managed to sort of come back and have gone through a career that uh, was too challenging and um, not interesting enough towards the end and then enabled me but ultimately ultimately enabled me to uh, take a chance and try and do something new I suppose the end point, my end thought, was just something that uh, a great quote that I saw a few years ago by Bukowski that just said, um, find what you love and then let it kill you. And I think, um, you know, you guys are at a young age. Um, find that thing that you love and then try and get to do it more often. Do it forever. Um, because the, more, the quicker that you can get there, the quicker that you'll get on to other things as well. That might not, you know, the thing that you love right now might not be the thing that's going to be the answer to everything. Um, you know, for me, it took me until I was 50 to even have that thought in my head that I should be doing something else and it took me until I was 56 to actually take that leap and move from one conveyor belt onto another one. And uh, that's it. Have a good one. Good luck with everything. See you later.